Okay, so I really hate these things. And uh, I, I'm here tonight to crash a party. And I wanted to to tell you that I, I wasn't just planning on attending. I just kind of found out at the last minute that you were doing this. And I really wanted to come out and have an opportunity to meet everyone and have a little bit of dialogue about what EFRAM is about and hand you out some, some important information. So Expertise for Municipalities is a not-for-profit association. We're a network of professionals who have been involved in the municipal sector for many, many years. And we want to empower excellence in the municipal sector. So we provide a number of services. We do everything from soup to nuts. And one of the things that um, we are here for is to uh, help in the office to do some work today. The other thing that we do is we're also integrity commissioners. We have been appointed by the municipality as their integrity commissioner. We do training, we do all kinds of things. And um, the last time I was here, so any of you who were at the last meeting, I apologize for the repeat performance in terms of some of the stories that I'm going to tell for the next couple of seconds. Council's job is very clearly defined in the municipal act. Council sets policy. Policy comes in the form of resolutions, bylaws, and other documents. It could be a strategic plan, it could be an official plan, it could be other things that the municipality requires by the province of Ontario. Staff's job is to do what council tells them. So they do that by implementing the bylaws, the policies, the resolutions that council has given them. So just to give you a little bit of background about me, I have been a member of council. I have also been the CAO for treasurer of a small municipality. I'm a workplace harassment investigator. And I, I, I say that I'm semi-retired and all my friends laugh because I think I'm busier now than I was before. One of my first experiences in working in a municipality is I had a member of council come in on a day when I was away and take up the greater and greater roads. That is not council's job. Council's job is to set the policy to say, 
we want the roads graded three times every summer. <coughs> Here's the dates we want them done by. It's not council's job to get in the equipment and ride the equipment. The other thing that I also hear often is that, you know, it's the clerk who's running the show. Well, you know what? The clerk is not running the show. The province of Ontario runs the show. The show is defined by the Municipal Act, the Planning Act, and a number of pieces of legislation. In fact, 54 pieces of legislation say that the clerk has responsibilities. And you got to know that the clerk has responsibility in those 54 pieces of legislation, so does council. So what I have for you tonight is I'm going to pass out these cards. And these are role and responsibility cards. It talks about what the role of council is, what the role of staff is. And if they're doing their job in good faith, the protection that they have under the municipal act is on that. And section 448 of the municipal act is very powerful. And it says that if you are acting in your capacity as an elected official, as a volunteer, as a staff person within a municipality, you are protected by this piece of legislation and you cannot be sued. If you step on, side, on the other side of the line, <coughs> that's a totally different story. The unfortunate circumstance that I have seen often these days is that you end up having members of council or members of the public who push members of council to make some decisions that are totally inappropriate and it's outside their jurisdiction. And members of council are actually being held accountable personally, and it's their house, their funds, everything that's on the line for, for those decisions. So it's really important that you understand the role of council and what they can and cannot do as a community. Because the province of Ontario gives you a very small window that you can make decisions in. The province mandates most of what you have to do, it tells you the, the services, the levels that you have to have, and I, I, I don't know what your budget's like, Melinda, but in most of the ones I've seen, probably 25%, if that is discretionary spending on behalf of council. Everything else the province tells you you have to pay. And it's a little bit different with you up here. Uh, I'm from Northern Ontario, and we don't have a county system. Uh, we have a, something called a visa, which is totally different, but you also have to fill out the costs for your county. So a lot of the money that you actually spend as taxpayers going into the municipality, about this much of it, council's making decisions on how it's spent. And those, de those decisions get to be really tough. And sometimes council has to make some really uh, challenging decisions that they're not necessarily going to be popular for, but that's their job. So for those of you who are already on council, I'm not going to give you one because you already have one of these cards. Everyone else, I'm going to hand them up to. And oh, here you go, I'll give it back to you now. Now that I'm off the soapbox. I will be around if anyone has questions after. During our question period, that you are respectful, that there's, I'm sorry, I've been to places where they've bashed council, they've bashed staffing, they've bashed volunteers. This is not the time or the place. If you have um, a problem, if you're not liking something the community does, something that you don't like something council does, you don't like events held, you don't like staffing, this is not the time or the place. And if you, if you do have a problem, you need to write a letter, take it to Mayor and Council, take it to your CAO. Please, I just ask you tonight, it's not the place. If heckling starts, if, you know, you start badgering, and I apologize in advance, but I will ask you to leave. If you get out of hand and you're disrespectful to the candidates, you're disrespectful to staff or to our volunteers tonight, I will ask you to leave. All righty? So we're going to start, I'm going to... Uh, introduce our first speaker and I'll stay up here while they're speaking I'll back up a little bit and then during question period we'll move the podium back to the center and open the floor to you guys okay <coughs>
So our first speaker tonight is uh, Mr. Ernie Belnut. He's already a counselor for you in this municipality, so we'll ask Ernie to stand and start off with him. Considerations with deep regret that I must inform you. Ah, uh, no, I'm just kidding. My name is Ernie Belden Jr., and I'm an introvert by nature. My interest in municipal politics here in HCM started just over a year ago when Jim Gibson and Debbie Grills resigned on the same day. What the hell? If you had asked me 14 months ago if I would ever consider running for council, I would have answered, Are you nuts? In fact, some people asked me last September, are you brave or stupid? Jury still out on that. I do come to council well prepared and represent the best interest of the whole community. I will be going door to door. I will be quite happy to discuss any issues that you have. Remember, I'm shy, so don't be afraid to get me talking. After a while, you can tell me to shut up and go home. I'd love to talk to you about perceived nepotism, the use of the rail bed, the money spent on legal fees, the cost of the harassment report, and how it was dismissed, and the way this council has treated former Councillor Foote and others. Even if you don't like me, if you believe I'm doing the right things, I would certainly appreciate your vote. Either way, please vote so that if council can be elected using the preferences of the electors. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ernie. Next up is uh, Fran Chamberlain. I don't have to get up, do I? No, I can't speak from here. Okay. Bye, <laughs> <laughs> Sandy. Rude, eh? Yeah. Good evening. Thank you, Cheryl, for organizing this evening so that members of our community can come meet us, the candidates. My name is Fran Kelly Chamberlain. I was raised in Sudbury, but was introduced to the beautiful Ottawa Valley 30 years ago by my husband Neville, and currently living in Mackey. I'm running for councillor for Head Claire and Mariah because I believe that I can be the voice of the people in matters that concern all of us. I'm a retired registered nurse with 35 years experience at Sudbury Regional Hospital with my last 15 years as clinical leader of the ambulatory care unit. While working, I was involved with the Ontario Nurses Union holding various positions, including local president. I was also co-chairperson of the hospital's health and safety committee. I've been a member of the Head Claire and Mariah Library Board since 2012. During my time on the library board, I've been involved in all of our fundraisers. I've been a member of the Canada 150 Celebration Committee and have also volunteered for the Trailside Cafe. I have volunteered for the Child Poverty Action Network Music Fest held in Mackey annually. Now the concerns that I have are number one, the budget. As always, this should be our number one concern. I would try to maintain low tax increases. Number two, that TransCanada Trail. I would try to find a workable solution for all parties involved. I want to support the existing businesses and promote new ones. The municipal office, I would like to do a review of how the office can better serve the residents of the townships. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. All right, next up is Patrick McGurin. Good evening. I'm Pat McGurin. Oops. How's that? Better? That's better. Okay. Does that count? <laughs> First thing I want to tell you is I want, I want to be clear that I have no business interests in Head Clara and Mariah. I'm not related to anyone in council, nor have any family or extended family members employed by our community. My personal work ethics do not allow for improper conduct or appropriate use of authority. Through my 45 years experience in federal and municipal governments, private industry, trade unions, and self-employment, I've built solid working ethics and learned effective problem solving and negotiating skills. 
I believe due diligence, positive attitude, integrity, communicating effectively <coughs> describe my ambitions. The overwhelming interest in council positions in the contest for the mayor's position clearly suggests to me that the five challenges found in the Wish Art Report are real. The Council of Tomorrow leads the way forward with a transparent, fair, and undivided council that is a bona fide cross-section of members of our community. In closing, I want to mention that I like volunteering, attending community functions, and attending council meetings. And if elected, I will give the trust you've affirmed in me my best effort and look forward to performing my share of volunteer work. Thank you for your time tonight. Have a happy election. Thank you, Pat. Next up is Gail Waters. <coughs> I was told I should stand, but it's not very comfortable that way, so I think I'll sit. Hey, Claire Mariah has long been home. The people, longtime friends and neighbors, where my family enjoys the quiet, peaceful lifestyle, where we can enjoy the extracurricular activities that the Four Seasons allow. My name is Gail Waters. I'm running for council to represent you, the voting people, our constituents in the townships of Hague, Claire, Mariah, from Mackey to Dewar Riviere. Some of the topics that I feel are important are continued health reserves for future sustainability as our past councils worked hard to achieve, continued work to access grants for townships, improvements of our infrastructures and our lands, a fire plan for evacuation, senior assistance programs, fair resolutions to hot topics, review of the economic development that benefits head Claire Mariah's bottom line. In closing, I plan to be a member of your council that is prepared to work towards decisions that benefit all. Thank you for your time and remember to get out and vote. Thank you, Gail. Next up is Bob Reed. Bob is our current mayor. Good evening. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Peggy, for putting this event on. Most of you know who I am. I'm Robert Reed, Bob. And that's what I go by. My wife and I, Lucy, moved up to this area in 2002, which I directly became a member of the local fire service. Uh, in I guess 2004, there was a vacant seat on council and somebody said, well, you should run. I've been running ever since, trying to get away. <laughs> but anyway, the, the, the issue at hand is I'm running to be your mayor again. I was never elected mayor, I know that. I was appointed. I think I'm not finished. I want to see development of everything that's on the table in a manner that coexists with everybody. Uh, I've had comments made to me, well, business should trump people. Well, to me, business doesn't trump people. People are the heart of this township. We've had nothing but fighting over the last two years, and that needs to change. We need to get back to where we were on a basis where we can walk out and call each other friends. The other hand is, yes, I'm attending county council. I see where most of our money goes, as Cheryl or Peggy had mentioned, that uh, what we gather in taxes doesn't stay here. It leaves. And previous mayors, Reeve, myself, we've done our best to keep the taxes to a minimum. And again, we did well this year. So, by all means, come and talk to me. My phone never rings at home unless somebody's hunting for me, and we'll leave that alone. But, uh, yeah, and thanks for coming out tonight, and I hope to meet each and every one of you. I know most of your faces, but sometimes my memory's not so good either. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Next up tonight is Debbie Grills. I have to stand. 
I had a profession of standing to speak, so here I am. This election is about a return to trust and public engagement in Head Claire Mariah. As a member of the public gallery during the past year, fellow residents and I have been disregarded in the decision-making process. Letters of concern have been directed on a number of occasions to individual councillors and the council as a whole. With the exception of one councillor, replies have not been forthcoming. It is time to recognize the integral part that this ordinary citizen plays in the life of a community, especially a rural community. As mayor of Head Clara Mariah, I would like to address some of the present concerns. With Council, I want to resolve issues around the Algonquin Trail. With Council, I want to create an environment where residents are able to express their opinions freely and without censure. <coughs> I want to improve the understanding of the different and unique roles of Council staff and public. I want to return to delivering municipal office services five days a week. With council staff and you, the public, I would like to also examine the ways we can improve high-speed internet service to our community. I would also like to introduce new initiatives to improve council's decision-making process. I would like to hold regular mayor's hours at the office. We now have the room in our building for privacy and quiet for quiet discussion. I would like to invite the residents to their municipal office to meet with me on a regular basis. I want to have discussions face to face with residents and listen to their concerns, suggestions and hopefully compliments about staff and council. As suggested in the report that was delivered to the council on July 24th of this year, I also want to be part of creating a strategic plan. This planning document would chart a successful future and fulfill our already HCM vision statement of providing a healthy, connected, and sustained community, teeming with possibilities for our citizens now and into the future. All that being said, this election is also about you, the voter, and the choices you make on election day. It is crucial for you to choose a council team who will work together for the good of all who live, work, and play in Head Clara Mariah. Please take the time to talk to the candidates, not just about them. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Next up is Chris Dalger, please. I am running for council because I care about the future of HCM and the people that live here. I'm a good listener, a forward thinker, and a problem solver. With my background in the insurance industry, small business ownership, and extensive dealings with the public, I feel I have the quality to be a great counselor. We live in a very small municipality. We must constantly think about moving forward and how we are going to promote HCM for business as well as residential growth. Our community's greatest resource are the people that live and play here. With your skills and knowledge, we can draw from that and eventually solve the issues that are within our control. I believe in taking the initiative with open discussion to solve problems. We are a small community, and why can't we help each other out by changing things to make it better? Through more discussion and conversation at the council table and with residents, I believe every decision made by council will be for the greater good of the community. Why do people move here? I believe it is for the natural playground that so many of us enjoy. There's less hustle and bustle, less meddling by government, less rules, and more freedom. <laughs> If I am elected, this is what I will promote, not reject. If I am elected, I will be fair, honest, and open in helping this community move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next up is Brian. 
Chris Allen. <laughs> that don't know me, my name's Calvin Chartrand. I was acclaimed in the last election and truthfully, I only put my name in then because if we couldn't have filled our council seats, we may have had to amalgamate with another township and let others make our decisions for us. I care too much about our community to see that happen and I am running now because I care just as much now as I did then. I'm here for one reason, because I care about this community, the whole community. 
There have been many accusations against me recently. Yes, I have done jobs for the township, jobs that nobody else would do. I didn't do them to line my pockets. In fact, I donated back either in time or use of equipment more than I have made. I care about the health and welfare and safety of all residents in these townships. I'm not here to further my own or any other special interest group at the expense of you, the ratepayer. With every decision I have been involved in making during the previous term, I have done my best to consider the greater community and vote accordingly. I want our community to be done with all the bickering and get back to the business of running our townships, not wasting the time of our employees or our tax dollars with frivolous and malicious nonsense. Thank you very much. And Thank you, Kelvin. And last up tonight is Kathy McKay, who also has a seat on the council. Good evening, everyone. Ed Clarimarie is about to elect a confident, on-fire group of people to represent you in the next term of four years. This group of individuals should work hard to maintain the peaceful presence of this community while striving to enhance infrastructure and be your voice to provincial changes. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kathy McKay. I grew up in this area, and even though my husband Brian and I live in Deep River, Head Claire and Mariah is home. Our cottage in Mackey is where we spend as much time as possible, and where we will live full time when we retire in a full year, a few years. While at our cottage, we take full advantage of all the outdoor opportunities our area offers, fishing, hunting, snowmobiling, and four-wheeling to name a few. I care deeply about this township, and I feel privileged to have been able to serve on council this past year. I am determined to serve you once again with integrity and committed to doing the hard work required to make informed decisions with the best interests of municipality and all our residents in mind. I have no personal agenda. I simply want to do the best job I can in a fair and impartial manner. My family and I feel truly blessed to be able to call Head Claire and Mariah home. We are very lucky to have a dedicated core of volunteers as well as a hardworking and committed municipal staff. Their hard work has enabled our residents to have access to some of the best programs, facilities, and events in the area. It was their dedication and the quality of life we enjoy here that inspired me to become a counselor last year. I would be honored to be given that opportunity to continue this work for another four years. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Now, missing tonight from our lineup is your counselor, Nancy, Ro Nancy Orr. She's decided to not run this term. Um, can't say Lamer, building a house, moving here a lot long ago. So that's why Nancy's not up here tonight. She's decided not to run for the next term. So I'm going to move the podium over, and we're going to open up questions for the, to the board. I would ask that everybody just uh, maybe three or four in a lineup at a time, and once somebody sits down, the next person can come up, all right? If you can say your name and where you where you live, all right. <laughs> you're first. <laughs> Good evening. You probably know me by now. I've been 20 years a council member and retired, resigned. I guess. Um, it is a big change for me interviewing job applicants to be candidates. I consider you people here as job applicants. In saying that, um, I was reading this information that Melinda kindly provided us, and there is this uh, Wishart report is something maybe the Ten Commandments you could try to follow. Um, I was very enlightened and uh, pleased to see the points made here. 
Anyway, after saying all that, I'll keep it brief. What I would like to ask uh, specifically to the candidates for uh, mayor uh, to provide leadership to council and also a reminder, for heaven's sakes, put it in writing. I would love to see reports coming from the county seat in writing when it's appropriate. That's something I did miss that the previous mayor did provide us. After saying that, I'll ask a question of the mayor candidates, but it's open to the floor. Um, the mayor is to provide leadership to council. And in that vein, I would like to ask the candidates for mayor, what is your idea of leadership as it stands? Or what is your idea of what the council, of what a uh, mayor should be thinking of when they're running? or when they're operating as mayor. And this is open to anyone who wants to jump in. Any ideas? So with that, I'll sit down and wait your answer. <laughs> You're a mayor. <laughs> There's also a mayor. Go ahead. Would you like to begin, Mayor <laughs> Only thing I can add is that. that. I'll have <laughs> questions further. And by the way, I'm mayor sorry, Reed. Mayor Reed, I'll let you go ahead in a minute. There will be another seance or fireside chat that's coming Sunday. And never mind the fireside, I'll provide the heat. Okay? Thank you. Not answer your question, it's to, to guide council and staff in such a manner that everything's done by what the provincial guidelines set out to do and to give advice to council if they come and ask for it within reason and to the best of my ability. <clears throat> Thank you for the, the question. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. um, in my opinion, um, being a leader of council, being a mayor, being the head of council um, requires, uh, requires a person, and I think I, I have the leadership skills to do so, someone who can run a meeting, someone who is used to making directions, someone who's used to making rules. I had 35 years of making rules in a classroom, and I don't think that making the rules at the council table would be too much different than that. Um, one of the things that I'd like to see at council is uh, a more respectful debate. Uh, people people uh, taking their turns, looking to the mayor uh, for the right to speak. Very, very simple things, but uh, the decorum at the council table is very, very important, and that's something that uh, I think I would have to uh, answer your question a little better at the first meeting that I was mayor at, because maybe I would have thought of it a little more. But thank you, Dave, for the question. <laughs> we'll talk Sunday. Okay. <laughs> Floor is open, people. Me again? <laughs> no, please. No, you said it I'm only allowed one question. That's it. <laughs> My name is Hank Mandor, resident of Mackey. Turtle Ball, I must say. Democracy is live and well in Yadgarma. I congratulate every one of you who stand forward to put your name to the head and job on council. I'm known as the old man in the bush. <laughs> now, I only have one question for all of the candidates. The uh, OMB, I think it is, puts on a council training sometime after the election. Do I have the promise of all of you, and just by a simple yes, will you attend those meetings as a council training? Thank you. Just to clarify, Hank, there is no special meeting after the election by OMB, but there are training sessions available that the township will attend with full council, per provided that the funds are made available through through the township. I'm sorry, Bob. Uh, I meant it's a specific training that's either done in North Bay or Pembroke, sometimes both places. It's, I think it's important. I've attended to quite a few of them. They're 
more on in the in one-on-one -on -one basis and small groups. It's a very good session. You learn a lot. Learn a lot about governance of a small community or a large community. I think we should all try to attend those meetings. Peggy. Peggy. Pe Peggy's going to answer. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to answer that, but I'm not using the microphone. Okay, so Municipal Affairs is the one who provides training, and um, we're not sure that uh, they're going to be allowed to do that this election because of the changes in provincial government. They're not even allowed. We have training sessions for municipal staff that have been canceled, so I'm not sure they're even going to hold those things. However, there are other groups that out there that do training for councils, um, EFRAM is one of them. The other is AMO. AMCTO offers courses. There's lots, but they're not affordable for small communities to send all <coughs> to council. So often what happens is one or two members of council get to go, and the others do not. Sorry that I have my back to you. Um, but the, the, the challenge is trying to make council training affordable so everyone understands the rules that they have to operate within. And that's when I said about the roles and responsibility and the small amount of decision making that you get to make. You know, council only gets to operate as a body. They don't get to make individual decisions. And so council's only authority is at a council meeting. And that's why it's really important that they do get appropriate training when it, after election. Some of it falls on, on the uh, CAO or clerk in a lot of communities and unfortunately, uh, sometimes animosity between council and the clerk provide a, a very unfavorable environment for training. And that's where a lot of organizations end up making a pile of money coming in and hiring lawyers and doing all that kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, Azure Integrity Commissioner, uh, Ephraim does not want to be here all the time, so we're going to ensure that council gets good training. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> No, I meant uh, you don't have to have a course. You can go and read the Municipal Act a couple oh, of times. Oh, good luck with that. Well, <laughs> no, not the whole Municipal Act, but if one is running for council, they should maybe put it upon themselves to get a copy and read the one section that describes the duties of a council member, the duties of a mayor. That's what I, that's what I already gave them in the role and responsibilities. Oh, okay. It's already there. Yes. Okay. You're making that easy. Hi, my name is Nancy Rose. I am currently one of your counselors. Uh, due to personal health issues, I will not be running, sadly. As you all know, I'm very passionate about the things that I do, sometimes favorably, sometimes not favorably. But I'm looking forward to hearing each one of you guys and uh, watching you fight the good fight. This is going to be interesting. My question, um, aside from the fact that privileged information was posted in the NRT today, uh, things about the cost of the harassment complaint, so on and so forth, which are confidential. Uh, the fact that council was called, uh, sorry, that the council has serious credibility issues, which I think is a liable statement. I'd like to know what that was based on. But my question is, a uh, number of months back, I asked Council if there was going to be an apology for the issues that were on the table. Uh, I asked if there was going to be financial restitution for the circumventing Council and going to a lawyer. That seemed to put a bee in somebody's bonnet, and that person thought that it was a, a stab at them. And since then, neither my husband nor myself have been spoken to by this Council member. Is this what I have to look forward to for the next four years? If I ask you a question that you don't like, or taxpayers ask you a question that you don't like, are you going to not speak to us? Are you going to ignore us? No. We're not going to, you going to take the ball no, and go home? Not going to happen. That's what I'm wondering. Not going to happen. I believe you, Bob. <laughs> Is there a question in here somewhere? <laughs> yes. Not, just was, ask well, yeah, that, I thought, not going to happen. To who? To who? Yeah. It's all, ask a question. Know, we get asked questions a lot that we don't like and we Absolutely. already like to deal with them in, in a mature manner and answer to the best of our ability. Sometimes we have to say, sorry, I can't answer that right now. Let me have a minute to go and you know, 
research the topic and get back to you. But, I mean, if I wasn't going to talk to people who would ask me questions that I didn't like, there would be a whole lot of people I would be talking to. So. <laughs> and that's probably the cheap way to handle it, right? <laughs> now, with, with questions and that, of course, what I look at doing is, instead of answering right away, is to put time to research and get the facts, especially from both sides of an argument, especially both sides of an argument. There's no reason to make a decision or an answer to a question right away if I don't have the information. We can defer it, we can talk about it again. Um, you know, sometimes, and it, it's a two-way street, sometimes people don't like the answer that's given, and uh, sometimes it's tough, but conversation discussion should always be open to you. When you win that, then it, it, everybody's left unsatisfied, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Brent. That was a great answer. Yeah. Ms. Rose, um, we talked about confidential, uh, not official news. So we talked about uh, confidential information being released in paper. Yes, I know. Uh, the price of uh, the legal counsel, I believe that was that was supposed to be confidential information, was not being. So no, nope, my apologies. So I have a sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, let me finish. Pardon? There's an um, email that went out to all the rate payers where it specifically says how much was yeah. spent, as, oh, as well my, as people, my apologies, as well as the people who were found guilty of harassment, mm -hmm. which. I'll uh, refer you to section F of our own HCM harassment policy that states the identities of the persons involved there must be kept confidential. It is the responsibility of the corporation, the council, and the staff to make sure that information is kept. So why was it not kept confidential? Pardon? Why was it not kept confidential? That's a good question. Council Sorry, that makes two. Made that decision. Okay, uh, but I'd, I'd like to know why you felt the need to say that we have serious credibility issues. Don't you think so? I think I'm pretty credible. Ask me a question, I'll tell you anything. You might not like the answer. Well, because your answer doesn't make you credible. Who are you to say I'm not? <laughs> I mean, given the fact that your name's been in the paper quite a few times, we, we need to debate credibility. Oh, oh. You could debate that. You could. Absolutely. You could. Yes. You lose. Oh, I'm not sure. Okay, so I just want to correct something that you know Nancy Rose said. So legal fees in general are something that is totally acceptable for the public to know. Legal fees related to the harassment complaint specifically, not so much. <coughs> interpret that June. June is my neighbor. I can call her June. Um, I'm going to interpret the question as why did you resign? Okay, there's only one other person in this room who's asked me that question directly. Mr. Myers. I gave him a politically correct answer 
Uh, and when I continued, he didn't finish. He didn't write it in the paper, but you did write part of it, didn't you, Terry? He doesn't remember. I do. Oh, see, and he a did sign. too. <laughs> That's a sign. Sure. This is for me a very, very personal question, and I have written this down because I, I want you all to know, but it is extremely personal to me. And I'm afraid, as I read this, I will offend someone. And I, and I just want you to know that I consider this now history. But I think there's a lot of people in the room who need to know the history. Um, as I stated in my speech, it is vital for the success of the community to have a council and staff that works together as a team. Therein lays my personal reasons for resigning from council. From spring of 2017 to July 2017, a number of events surrounding the use of the former rail bed transpired to make me realize very clearly that I did not have the respect, trust, or support of my fellow councillors. I chaired the May 12, 2017 council meeting in Mayor Gibson's absence, where for the third time the issue of the Algonquin Trail was deferred until the scheduled public meeting to be held on September 9, 2017. Sometime after that meeting, I was shocked, surprised, and truthfully very hurt when a two-page flyer arrived in my mailbox that contained a number of misleading and what I consider disrespectful statements about Mayor Gibson and myself. It was from a group called HCM Friends of Non-Motorized Rail Trail. Now these people are residents, comprised of people I had considered personal friends. They are my neighbors, a fellow councillor, members of staff, yet not one of them had contacted me personally to discuss the concerns as outlined in that flyer. <coughs> so I was at a point that in addition to council, I no longer felt that I had the trust or support of friends, neighbors, or staff. In July 2017, Mayor Gibson informed me of his intention to resign from his position. And then I had a very difficult decision to make. At the time, I was the alternate head of council and would have taken his place. However, I decided that I would not have enough support to successfully continue on council. However, then I became a council watcher, council watcher. And since that time, I have attended every council meeting with the exception of one, and I've read every public document that's been posted on the municipal website. I may have resigned, but I didn't quit. So, maybe back to what June's asking me. So you may ask, why am I returning and asking for your vote? Well, because it's never too late to make a difference. My name is Paul Cody. I'm a resident of Mackey. I have a question for the current council, and uh, if new candidates want to Jump in, no problem. When considering or eventually passing a resolution that impacts people of Mackey, do you think it's proper and professional to maybe contact these people for their input? Yes or no? Absolutely. Absolutely? Yeah. 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 And yeah. any other community, and okay. any resident that's affected. Thank you. I also agree with uh, and when we were discussing the new snowmobile trail, I personally called people that I knew were affected by it. I walked the trail. You need, we did the stakeholder meetings with residents. And those are the types of things that you need to do to get to hear what people have to say. Um, warming committees with residents and, uh, and business owners, whoever might be affected by a certain issue. All things, all tools that we need to use and have used in the past. I think your question 
regards what's coming up in our next general meeting. Yeah, you, not the rail you did that for all personal yeah. resolutions or just certain ones? Yeah. For the ones that we were discussing at that meeting, the snowmobile trail, the multi-use trail. For any resolution that impacted? Uh, any resolution I would do it for. Yeah. Okay. If I'm elected, I, I would promote a question and answer period before every council meeting or during at the beginning of every council meeting for the residents to express their opinions on any resolutions that have come up in the past. And what I would like to do is every new resolution that comes up, I want to defer it for a month to give all of the residents opportunity to contact all council and attend the meeting to express their opinion on what you want. Very good, very professional. But I feel, I feel that the, the public have not known what the resolutions that are coming up at the meetings are until they're up and done. There's no preamble on anything so far. And so what we need to know is if there's something that's gonna affect everybody, let us know before this, becomes a finalized thing and nobody's had a chance to an uh, ask about it. That and we saw so the uh, answer question and answer period is a very good idea. No, absolutely. And there is a, pro there is a process right now that is short, but uh, the time span before the actual council meeting. But it'd be nice to see something that's up ahead. We know it's coming four months down the road. And so we're going to talk about it. So, like, key things that are coming up ahead, big decisions that are going to take multiple meetings to discuss, and we can always put forth an upcoming uh, council uh, resolution uh, page or something on our um, on the HCM website just to try and keep residents ahead of the issues. Because, as we all know, a lot of the residents, we're a big municipality, a lot of kilometers here, and some people don't have access to online stuff and all of that, and um, it's just important to try and, and I know staff does a, a job to try and get everybody informed in that, but we can always, and that's the number one thing, we can always do better, right? You know, there's, it's called the better mousetrap. There's always a better mousetrap. We invented it, it worked, you can always make it better. It still does the same thing. I, I think that, uh, uh, Sir, you are concerned with what's happening on Harvey Creek Road, is, am, I, am I correct? You're close. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I was, I was sitting in the public gallery when, they, when the, that, that was discussed briefly. May I ask, is that a launch ramp you're talking about, Harvey Creek? You can ask the gentleman here. I, I'm, I, Just I, access. I am, I am access. supposing. Because I had somebody hot under the collar. I had no, obviously I was just a constituent. Same at the end of Boudreaux yeah. Road, down yeah. by Hill. He was making it up okay. to be a... Sorry, Mr. Okay. Quickle, we're getting into a conversation. We just want yeah. an answer I see only other okay. people can give yeah. conversations. No, okay. but so after you can ask another question. Oh, I can. Well, Thank you. Everybody else is done. Oh, okay. So, so, so we as a council pass a lot of what I call omnibus bills, where there's five or six issues under one resolution, and I would like to see that practice stop so that everything becomes clear and you're not trying to figure out um, in the budget document what else that does. <coughs> Sorry to get up again. My name is Silver Steve. You know what? We're just going to hang on a minute. We have other people. One at a okay, time. Okay. And then I'm once... Nope, we've got a gentleman over here coming up. But thanks, but after you can come back, okay? Hi, and uh, thank you all for uh, taking the step and leap, I guess, and going to council for the next four years. I'm Todd Dowser, I'm a local business owner in Stonecliffe. On along that same, same vein, I'm just going to continue that uh, because I can actually point to a number of resolutions that have passed the council that have had no stakeholder consultation. And I'd be happy to provide that list if anybody wants to see it. So along that same vein, I strongly suspect the use of small bills and ATVs on municipal roads and property will be on the next council agenda next week. What is your position on this matter regarding the use of small bills and ATVs on municipal roads and property? 
I'd like to hear from each of you. Anyway, 
So bylaws do not require it. Okay, okay. a snowmobile has to follow the rules of the road. If it says it's 50 kilometers, it's 50 kilometers. If it says it's 20 kilometers, it's 20 kilometers. As far as ATVs, That's not right. I am not aware of any issues with ATVs on municipal roads at this point. I could be, I may not have heard of anything, maybe there are some out there. So I'll go back to sort of my original speech and go down to why do people move here. And one of my points is less meddling by government. So what is wrong with keeping the status quo on ATVs and snowmobiles as it is today? <coughs> I'm, uh, I'm in favor of uh, the use of ATVs and snowmobiles on uh, municipal roads. Um, the hardest part of that is going to be uh, understanding that some people's uh, uh, lack of respect for others uh, will cause problems. Uh, but there's also a, a large group of people out here in our community that I, I don't think there will be a problem with that because they are respectful. It's the outsiders you're going to have to watch. That's the way it's going right now on the trail. I think, uh, mm -hmm. like I say, I'm all for it. There's, there's bound to be some rules and regulations, but uh, it has to respect everybody else's views. I was born and raised here, ran snow machines up and down the roads, ATVs up and down the roads, but it was always done with respect. My grandfather made sure drive past somebody's house, you slow down, you don't create dust, and you don't endanger anybody. I live right here on Moggers Road, I don't see that. We get a hundred machines by here every weekend, we don't see that. I agree they should be on the road, I was on the road, everybody else is. There has to be rules, and we need some kind of enforcement in the area. I see one OPP show up here on I believe it was Monday, I was working in the garage, Monday afternoon, everybody's gone home. The only car I've seen on our road all year. So, yes, they should be on the roads, there's no problem with it, but we need respect and we need some laws. Thank you. I agree with Calvin and it sounds like everybody else about using the municipal roads, but I do agree that we need to have some kind of restrictions on, or even somebody watching all the people who are, let's say, going too fast or dust and that type of thing. And I think if we just teach people, have um, uh, signs up, and if we have to have more OPP, if, if you get, yeah, I think we can even hire some for weekends, and if they're on certain spots that people tend to speed on, if they're there for a few weekends, I'm sure these young guys that usually do the back and forth, they'll stop if they get a few tickets. So if we can do something like that, but let's have, um, when we're making all these big decisions about that, if, if people want to have a meeting about it, just, just that issue, let's have one. Let's do that. And then everybody can give their pros and cons to it. Yeah, to answer to everybody from me, I'm all in favor of the snow wheels and ATVs using the roadway. Not a problem. Who's going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. Who's going to pay for the policing? Right now, our municipal staff is busy trying to do a whole lot of stuff. We pass a resolution, it takes time. We do this, it takes time. Okay, fine. Are we going to get volunteers from the community? I mean, I, I've heard everybody talk right now about this. That's all fine and good. I, I believe the trail, the, the four-wheelers and the snow wheels should be allowed to use the road. Should have been at my place this weekend. Okay, I'm sure Cheryl and Tom have figured that out by now. They're going by my place with, sometimes you can't even tell what kind of machine it was. But anyways, that's, that's all I've got to say. Everybody's saying enforcement, but who's going to pay for it? I have, I've always supported ATV and snowmobiling um, on the roads. My understanding was that if the speed limit posted is 50 kilometers an hour, if you're driving your machine, you reduce your speed to half that. So there's that law in place. The bylaw for ATVing 
has been brought to the table before. It was for the years that I worked here, a couple of times, I think. I don't think having them on the road is the problem. I think the problem is we have no way of policing. And we paid in policing costs $91,000 plus dollars out in 2017. Anything added to those calls is increased pays out, money paid out. That's increased tax dollars that comes back to you at some point in time. So the whole policing of this motorized trail system and motorized using the, the machines on the road and stuff, um, it becomes a money issue at some point in time. Safety issue, all of that, those same arguments that we've been through a thousand times before in the last two years. Um, so that's, that's kind of going to be your bottom line. So they should be on the road, but how do you make them behave on the road? I think uh, some of us are getting mixed up between the Algonquin Trail and the Municipal Road. Now, again, I'm going to go back to my four R's now. It used to be three R's, but the last new R is reasonable. What is reasonable for a community of 250 people full time who enjoy and come here, even those who are visiting, come here for a certain type of recreation? You know, it could be snowshoeing, but it could also be ATVing. It could be cross-country skiing. It could be snowmobiling. The, I think the point of Mr. Dowser's question is the municipal road. Our, I think he is concerned, as are some other people who have mentioned to me as well, that they're going to be restricted from using their snowmobiles or ATVs to get to the trails. Yeah. Now, in my case, if, uh, if that was the case for us, we would have to trailer our snowmobile 100 meters to stay off the municipal road. I mean, if we wanted to follow the law, if we're going to make the law to say that snowmobiles or ATVs can't go on a municipal road, we have to be reasonable. And, and this has to be looked at carefully, in my opinion. And people come up here. If I look around, I, I came from... Uh, the, well, it was a village of Stittsville, now it's the city of Stittsville. And I watched the rail bed in Stittsville turn into a trail. And what happens is it evolves to the way the people live and play there. Now, in Stittsville, I'll guarantee you there are not too many snowmobiles because they want to get out of there and come up here. Now, we, we have to keep that in mind. That's my opinion. I'd like to see... Um, some very thoughtful decision making when it comes to uh, restricting use of ATV or snowmobiles here. I think that's what you're waiting for. I am, actually. <laughs> okay, so now before we go on to the next person who's going to ask a question, I wanted to provide some additional information for you to think about. Because, and I cannot remember the year, but I want to say it was somewhere 2012, 2013, the province of Ontario said that if you want ATVs to be on your municipal roads, you must pass a bylaw allowing them to be on your roads. So if you don't have a bylaw, right now they're in contravention if they're going on your roads. So the other thing that council will also have to weigh into the considerations when they're, they're doing uh, any kind of bylaw but this one specifically is about road maintenance. Now, um, the challenge municipalities have is they can be sued for just about anything. And case law has shown that if you are walking along the shoulder of the road and you fall and you break something, you're going to sue the municipality and you get the money. So municipalities are now having to make sure that their shoulders of the road in rural areas are also uh, accessible enough for past, uh, for people to walk on in the winter time. And that is a challenge as well. So there's a lot of factors that you have to think about when you are making decisions at the council table. So when you put your hat on as a councillor, as a head of council, I challenge you to, to think about all of those things and not just think about the people at the, in the office, or in the, uh, the, the gallery banging the table. Because that's what happens often, is you get people who are vocal, who come out, and they make statements. And sometimes they don't completely understand all of the, the, the stuff that has to go into the decisions. So one of the things that we, we 
talk about is community engagement, and it goes back to the, one of the previous questions. I think it's important that council establish a community engagement plan that says, here's when we're going to engage people. Because I'm pretty sure not all of you want to know that they're going to pass the resolution to adopt the minutes from the previous meeting. What you want to know is things that are going to be of interest to you. Things like bylaws that have to do with ATVs going on the roads. And then you can have a presentation that says, here's all the law that we have to deal with. And, and, and it creates a better community when you actually understand what the decisions are, or how the decisions are made. So, who's next? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think most of you know me. My name is Jim Gibson. I uh, served this municipality 17 years on council. My question tonight, spurred by something Mr. Cote said, I've never met you, but pleased to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. Our current <coughs> procedural document, for those of you who don't know, every municipality is forced by the province of Ontario to have a procedural document. Basically, it's how you run your business in your council meetings. Our procedural document does not allow residents the ability to address council with respect to an item on the council package. When I send all of you, and I'm addressing this to the current council members, when I send all of you a solution to this problem, why did you ignore me? And why did some of you not even have the common decency to acknowledge the receipt of that email. I would appreciate an answer from each council member. I'll go first on that. Um, I was one of the people that did acknowledge the email. Um, I was one of the people that did acknowledge you, but I also took the time to research your question and went to um, the internet and looked at all municipalities around, small municipalities, large municipalities, and the way that our municipality handles that situation is we have either a little more lead time than most municipalities, a little less, but we're all around the same amount of time. It's not something that we're just doing so that we don't hear what our residents have to say. It's the norm, and the, so there, there's other ways that you can get your thoughts to us after, through email, phone calls, we're all accessible. And then you also have the chance to bring deputations to council at a later date. Okay. As far as I was concerned, uh, there was about a hundred emails going around at that time. They were all related to the same thing. We were on opposite sides of the issue. You quit. You weren't going to listen to what I had to say anyway. And for anybody that doesn't know me, I'm pretty much computer illiterate. But I do know that I can tell when an email was read. So you knew I read it. That's all you needed to know as far as I was concerned. And as far as the whole bringing it up before the meeting, I was at the meeting when we discussed it before. This was three years ago, I guess, or whenever it was. And you said, no, that's fine, because if we do it any other way, it's just going to disrupt the meetings, and it's just chaos, and it's no good. So, but all of a sudden, when you quit council for your whatever reasons, you decided that now you want people to have a voice. People should always have a voice. We're here to support you, to work for you. My phone don't ring. I got three of them. Never had my phone ring. I had it once before our council meeting one night, and that was to try to sway my vote another way. But other than that, my phone's never rang. As far as the email, I'm sorry, people. I checked them. If it's important, I will get back to you. But I'm pretty slow at typing, and I'm busy most of the time. But always feel free to call me. The numbers are right in the thing. I don't need the mic. Uh, my name is Randy Orr. I live at uh, Edgewater. 507. Sorry? We haven't heard from Mr. Mayor. 
I didn't think I needed to respond. Yes, Jim, I got your email. I did not respond to it. Uh, for the simple reason, I think Calvin explained it pretty good. You were on council long enough, plus you were head of council long enough, that if that's the way you had felt, you should have changed it. I do remember the meeting that Calvin is talking about, that no, things are fine, we should leave it that way. But I'm not going to get into he said, she said, who said. But, uh, yeah, I did not respond to you. That's right. Uh, Mr. Gibson, I did respond. One, we wrote up a resolution. You know where that wound up. I think that terminated me for sure. So, uh, David. enough with lobbying. Yeah. Coming after. Yeah, sorry, it's just for the existing guys up here right now. Oh. So I don't know if this is the point of where if I can ask, is it appropriate to ask what was the solution? What is this big? No, that's it's not. We asked to the existing council, so oh. we just got to keep the night going. Sorry. <laughs> I'll see you soon. <laughs> yeah. All right, my name's Randy Orr. I live at 507 Edgewater Way. I just moved here. I retired out of the Army. Here's my question. It's a simple question. It's just a yes or no. It's directed to the nine individuals that are currently running for council. And then the second part, I'm allowed to start questions. Sure. The second part will be addressed at the two running at the mayor. My question is, the township's been plagued with the rail bed, Algonquin multi-use rail bed. <clears throat> I don't read the papers very much, but I have heard that they ran out of money. If I'm wrong, somebody can correct me, but that's what I heard. So we'll go with what I heard, they ran out of money. <laughs> My question to the council and nine of them, if they come along and say, we want you to cough up money, either out of the surplus that we all have in the township, or the money that's currently for the taxes that we pay, comes down and you got to vote, I would like to know if you would vote to say yes, use our tax money, or no, don't use our tax money. So it's a pretty simple question, yes or no. Well, I would, I would look at it right away. It's, it's not if I'm voting yes or no, it's with the residents. Okay, it's, it's a sim sorry to interrupt. But I wouldn't vote yes or no unless I heard from the residents on that issue. So it comes from county to council. <coughs> That's right. Right? So we have it, you get your input. So I would like to know what your input is. So my question is how much money are we asking for? Okay, let's play fairs here. Well, that's like, well. It's a simple question. If they're asking for a dollar, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, or a half a million. The last one was a hundred and fourteen thousand dollars that got donated. You're out of money. I just want to finish answering. As sure. As, 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 okay. as I said, you know, I am representing the residents of our township. If, if we have a discussion about that, majority of the residents feel that it's a good uh, investment to make and with with sound arguments and sound facts um, the vote would be yes if the majority of the residents that talk to me and, and discuss at those committee meetings say it's a bad idea it's not going to work we don't want to invest our tax money into something like that then it would be no I'm here to represent the ratepayers it's not my decision your decision. That's what's important. I represent, a counselor represents the constituents. Okay? And that's what I'm going to do. So I'll finish what I was saying. It's pretty hypothetical. I guess it depends on the amount of money. I would certainly uh, deal with it a lot <coughs> different if they were asking for 100 grand than I would if they were asking for 10. So I can't answer that question without knowing uh, a little bit more. <coughs> But I would certainly look at it. I agree with both Mr. Allen and Mr. Villeneuve that it is, it's a simple question, but there is no simple answer to that. It does certainly depend on how much money they're asking for and what it's for. You know, are we spreading stone dust? Are we widening the trail? I make no bones about it. I, do support the Algonquin Trail. I think as far as the future goes, the legacy of the trail will always be there. We will never know 
what the future of all our crown lands are going to be, but this trail is always going to be here. So it's not a simple answer. And I agree with Mr. Allen, the whole issue would be, what do the residents want? Do we, do we form committees and, and try and discuss it at that point? Do we have a referendum? I am not, I am in favor of referendums as well. It's about you guys. That's what this is about. You know, for the first time in years, you're going to elect a council that is going to work for you. I guess I'm going to have to uh, agree with most of what I've heard. Uh, not being uh, warned about this money situation, uh, it, could, it could present an issue, and again, it could also divide the community further. We want to think about that real hard. Um, I, I believe that uh, the information given to me, or the, uh, the comments given to me by the taxpayers and the stakeholders would be uh, what I would go with. Uh, as, as the other people said, that's, that's what we're here for, hear from you, take the information that we have at hand and make the best decision. My understanding that the provincial government cut the funding on the trail. So uh, as far as Head Claire and Mariah, we've got approximately a million dollars in reserves. We probably could do a kilometer and a half and you'd end up with a bank on each side and you'd be broke. There'd be no more million dollars in reserve. If people really wanted it and it was done in a referendum and the majority was for it with regards to liability, safety, and it was going to be done right. Absolutely. Any other way? Definitely not. I wouldn't spend a nickel on it. It's the provincial government cut out of it. The Redford County gets their money from us. The biggest chunk of our money doesn't stay here. How are we going to pay for something of that magnitude? I mean, to do a kilometer of that trail in our townships million dollars easy. There's a culvert right up the rail bed here that's an easy $250,000 for one culvert. That's a lot of money to sink into where are you going to start, where are you going to end. We don't have the resources as far as my knowledge in these townships. Federal, provincial government wants to kick in a pile of money, something to look at. If we could do it, I really can't see it happening. When you look that it took $140,000 to do 10 kilometers of trail near Arm Prior, which is a fairly easy section of the trail to do, and that's not maintaining, that's just what it took to build that section of the trail, I'd have to agree that how can we afford to build and maintain on the long term a trail when we really have no idea what it's going to cost, number one, to maintain it, police it, fire safety, there's so many unanswered questions. I would not be willing to spend any taxpayers' money until we had some definite answers first. And um, the county of Renfrew has already come out at the very beginning saying that they would not spend a penny of taxpayers' money on this trail, that it would all come from grants and donations. So, if they're saying no taxpayers' money is going to be spent on it, I don't even think that's going to be an issue then. Well, I don't think anybody tonight can say yes or no to that question because there's so many ifs, theirs, and buts. But if they were coming down to anything like that, we have to ask the public off, off their opinion, what they think, and if they were willing to give any money towards it, if not, or the government, to, et cetera. But to give an answer yes or no tonight would be idiotic. I agree primarily with what Chris um, said, but if county sent me a letter and said they needed an answer tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, my answer would be no with um, the reason that research into it would be required. But because we're here to um, do what you need us to do, 
it still has to come back to, to everybody here, especially the amount of money that we're talking about and the amount of the issues of issues that have not yet been resolved. Oh, so, yeah, that's kind of where I would go with it. No, that question wasn't for us, that was for okay. potential counsel. I believe the second Did part was for the mayor. Uh, no, I'm going to save okay. the second part for okay. a later date because okay. I will do just a little bit more research into it and give all the parameters. Okay. Can I just add just one thing, Randy? Sure. Um, uh, at county council, they mentioned that, um, yes, the funding, the present funding has been cut by the new government. But it was my understanding that the uh, MTO or the Ministry of Transportation wants to get the cyclists off the highway. Mm -hmm. And that may be where some dollars come from. So, uh, from MTO. Yeah, from MTO. Well, the, and, and it just so happens that the new minister is a Renfrew County guy. So, we may, you know, we may see something. You may see that in the southern portion of the trail, or the eastern portion of the trail, but I don't think you'll see that here. Thank you. We, we don't have the cyclist on the road yet that there is in the east. But it could come to fruition, who knows. But the, the funding is dried up. <laughs> it's all about options. Something like that comes to the table. Here are the options. Can we afford it? Is it financially feasible? Does the residents want it? And the options of if you want it, this is what's going to happen. Your taxes are going to go up 5% because we can't just simply pay for it. We have to create new revenue in order to pay for it. So the options should all be laid out of exactly this is what's going to happen, this is the maintenance cost, this is what we're going to have to do in order to achieve that goal. If it's raising taxes, uh, <coughs> selling municipal land, which I don't think there's much left, anything like that, whatever options are there, those will be there. So Out of the earlier discussion between you and the, the audience, uh, the, the question was the uh, <coughs> uh, statement is that people get divert from the uh, town hall, and especially people who are here, it's a long travel. You're right, some people cannot attend meetings. In the past, in the 90s, when I was on this council, we used to have a meeting periodically in the year. With this council coming up, we say that this kind of uh, Possibility? If there is a place available, I don't even know. Where, where in church there would you be able to hold the meetings? We used to, I think we met in the church. Church is closed. The church, church belongs to Johnny Miller. Yeah. Maybe he'll rent it to us all <laughs> <laughs> The, the um, recordings for all the meetings are also posted on YouTube, so you can go online and listen to the meetings. So that's an option, but I mean, if there was a place to hold meetings, I would definitely be willing to travel. Oh, something to consider. Okay. Yes. Or if we have volunteers or something that we can have people get in contact with the municipality that they need a ride or something, then maybe there's some resident volunteer that might go and pick up a few people. It doesn't hurt, right? It's just about trying. Try and make something work. Sure. And another option would be uh, maybe some hold meeting or two a year on a Saturday afternoon. <coughs> Can I just screw up the question? Sorry. So, uh, so I think it's certainly worthy of uh, a discussion yeah. with council. Actually, before you even mentioned it, um, I was going to mention a week ago, Sunday, we had a barbecue up in Mackey, or sorry, up in Du Rivier. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people came out, and it was it was wonderful. We had a really good turnout. But a lot of them were expressing that they feel that they're being treated like they're at the other end of the world. And we had mentioned, you know, come on out and vote. And a lot of them mentioned there's no voting station. 
in Du Revier for them. And so, you know, would you guys consider a voting station or maybe offering your services to go and pick up these people and bring them to the voting stations because we're losing that whole that whole geographical area. Well, I can't do that as a candidate, um, but uh, yeah, I'd be, I know, I have friends and family that, that would help out. You know, it, it's one of those things, and that's one of the, fa you know, the fabric of our community is being a volunteer. You know, Absolutely. it really is. You know, and so that is just another way how we can come together and help out. It's tough sometimes, and it, it's what we call somebody being a champion. They take on and they call up provide services, it's the organization part of it. So I, I know with the people of the residents we have, we solve it for sure. But it's just, we need awareness. You know, and I wasn't aware of it until and a week ago Sunday that yeah. this is how everybody felt and that there was no voting station. But there was a voting station yeah. up, uh, up until a couple they, of years ago. They can't, they can't hold a, um, since the, ch the change of the municipal law, does not allow them to have a polling station up there because they do not have a public building. Mm -hmm. They can't hold a, a polling station in a private dwelling any longer. Okay. At Which one they time did. they could. Well, maybe we need to yeah. look at how to get those people here. Well, you know, uh, I think that's something that the candidates would probably be happy to, to, to phone around some of our people that we have helping us and uh, just put a bulletin out. Just some food for thought. Yeah, thank it's you. a good one. Thank you. It's all about people helping people. You know, back in the 90s when we had the discussion about amalgamation, as you all remember that, and we were here at the time, was opting out to join the wide area. Cameron, Papineau Cameron. And you know, the people in, in Uruguay are feeling disfranchised. You know, they're feeling left out. And you know, when, even if we had to buy a, a property, I think we still own a property in, in Uruguay that we could possibly make a municipal building for the uh, old salt shelters. I think we still own that. I'm not sure. Yes. But we still own property in Uruguay that we could do something. If not, then we have to use <coughs> transportation of some sort to get people down. And that was the reason why we did do a barbecue up at Little Fall Park, mm -hmm. to try and get them involved and to give them a chance I, to I hear. appreciate, I yes, appreciate I the, we do, I it. I mean, that's, nice that's good, because I mean, that doesn't solve the problem. No, it doesn't. One, one but we didn't time. know, we didn't know they were really feeling that until we got, got there at the barbecue and started talking to the people and hearing what they had to say and how they felt and, you know, so it's a step, it's a small step. It's a start. And we have applied for funding for a van, or we put well, in a motion you know, to, and that could be something that could be used to transport the, the, the maybe for meetings. A lot of boys were talking about putting money into a trail. Well, I think it's a lot more important to look after your residents so that they can do it here. If you're going to throw some money at something, maybe that's what you should be looking at. Well, we applied just. And I'm all in favor of a trail, don't get me wrong. But you don't always have to fly. Sometimes you have to do it. Well, we put in our share, and I believe the proposal has gone in already, and we're waiting for an answer. Okay, why would you be doing that when you have maybe one one meeting left, maybe two? Why wouldn't you wait until after the election? It may be deferred. Well, I hopefully it would be. Because <laughs> there's probably going to be new people with new opinions. Yeah, I don't think you'll see any major major legislation done at the next couple of meetings. Okay. Because now we're into the lame duck period. Okay. All right. Where it'll be left to the new council. Hi, my name is Richard Burrell. I live in downtown Derry here. <laughs> I thank you for your concerns. 
<laughs> a lot of times, uh, we know what's going on all the time. If we don't show up, it's because we don't want to. <laughs>
jumped out at me was the overhead for the office and sundry items connected with the office. Well, we it's had, near half our municipal budget. Well, we budget. had the uh, microphones that people requested, the new sound system. Near half our municipal budget went on administration. Right. Near half. Okay, well, I don't know. So David, well, if there's a question, I'll make sure you stand up and ask it. Not, <laughs> One more question. This is okay. <laughs> Testing. No, we're not on. Hold on. Uh -huh. Am I on now? No, you're not on. Oh, it's on. Sitting here. Green light go. Um, yes, one thing uh, future council members could check into is looking at other municipalities and comparing our administration costs to theirs. Maybe half our municipal budget is, you know, is part of the course. But uh, <clears throat> from when I left council, it was currently 400 and some odd thousand. And the total budget is something like 9.5. So that would be an interesting statistic. Maybe it falls in line with the rest of the municipalities in this area. Something to look into. Thank you. Were you, did you, were you referring to the general administration fees? General administration fees, That's 400 like a, and some odd bucks, 1,000 bucks. The budgeted amount for 2018 is 171,000 plus dollars. That doesn't total, take into account the uh, wages and salary. That's just the general administration line. That's the one I'm talking about. Because that's what I thought Todd asked about, was general administration. I think Todd has the figures on it. I think you mentioned the figures, Todd. I think they're out of here. All right, we're going to. Um... We're going to continue now with some anonymous questions that have come in. And uh, so what I'll do is I'll mention the candidate that has been asked. And again, if you prefer not to answer, that is okay. The first one is for Debbie. Uh, if council is not what you want to work with, Will you quit? Uh, it's not a matter of wanting. It's a matter of what the voters want. Okay, it's, it's my suggestion that this is the first time in 21 years that the voters have had an opportunity to make a choice like this. Okay. And I'm leaving it in their hands. This is for the existing council that are at the table right now. In your term of council, can you tell us what money has been spent on grants, what grants have come in, and that has been allocated for the specific items? I don't know the total dollar values, but this is full land of this building here. The hall, all sitting. the maintenance, all the seniors' projects that you see outside, the playground, the, the, playground, the ballpark, the old bottom. Mackey Park. Is on. there a possibility that a list can be done up as to what grant money has come in that has purchased or has I <laughs> did check into it earlier uh, a few weeks back, and I, I'm sorry I can't remember the numbers, but grant applications alone by one employee, the money received to these townships more than paid one employee salary. No, I understand that, but <coughs> what people are asking me is, is it's, it's unfortunate. There's a misunderstanding that things that have been purchased for the playground, for example, somebody's asked me, why did we spend our tax dollars on that? And I was it's pretty sure it was grant money. It's so grant money. It is grant money. It's grant money. Maybe you would be able to have accessible to the general public what was paid with grant money. Not necessarily the amount that's irrelevant, but what what was funded by grant money and not taxpayers' money. Maybe that's something that I wish could go in the next newsletter. That would be fantastic. Okay. Can I add? Can I? add to that. Sure. Um, uh, the thing that uh, con concerns me the most is that people don't consider grant money tax money. It is our money. It's just coming from a different source. Yeah. It's still our money. And it's my suggestion that uh, perhaps with a new gov this new government that we won't be seeing the handouts that we saw before. And we've gotten um, a little attached, a little too attached to grant money. But my opinion. This question is for Mayor Reed. 
Can you explain to the audience why your council had to hire an integrity commissioner? Eventually, it's going to be mandated in 2019, I believe, that all councils have an integrity commissioner. We needed to get an integrity commissioner for the amount of charges that were coming forth against personnel, be it council or be it staff. There's got to be a way to control. Thank you. This question is uh, for two candidates, for Brent Allen and Chris Dowser. There's two questions. Have you taken the time to volunteer for any function put on by the township in the last year? Function by the township? I can't say that I have. I have uh, volunteered extensively with the Snowmobile Club. But this one is just for the township. Anything to do with the township? No, I have not. Okay. Um, it's very, it is, some people, as a large part of our community, are the retired community. I am here trying to make a living to support my family. And unfortunately, the my nature of, of work is not subsidized by the government, like a government worker or PCL, where there's money there and you get a paycheck every week. I have to live in order to turn my lights on and feed my family. So uh, most of the um, events are during the summer, warm months, weekends, where those are the busiest days for my business. But I'm always there donating when I'm asked for prizes, for anything like that. Um, the last one was uh, the um, Suds' uh, uh, baseball memorial from Patrick Sutherland. I'm more than happy to donate to that. And I've done that in the past from the library board. I put in uh, a softball team when we had the Patricia Lair softball game here a few years ago. I took a team from Pine Valley. We had a lady suffering terrible cancer and we put a team in and named it after her. Um, so I do my best with trying to survive and so sometimes it's tough. We used to enjoy the New Year's parties here when they were here. We used to come. Um, but in the last little while, I gotta keep the lights on and it's very important. All right. So and then I, I do understand being self-employed, I get that. Uh, so I'm going to ask this question then. On your off season, will you be available to any events that the, the township may have? I know you don't really have an off season because you've got snowmobiling in the winter and you've got camping in the summer, but can the community count on you on some sort of off season to participate? Well, I hope the community can count on me now, not later. Uh, you know, I've never done something that would warrant the community not to not want to ask me to help. As a lot of people know, we help whenever we can. That's, you know, our parents raised us, me and Nicole, my wife, to help when needed. And that's why we're here in the community that does that. So I don't have to wait till later. I can help now if, if, if it makes sense. If, if, I, if I have time to do that. Absolutely. I, I am the same way. When... Uh, when the shoulder seasons are here. No, I know. Got, got to make hay with the sunshine, and I get that. Yeah, when the shoulder seasons are here, we, we have more time to volunteer. We have more time to do other things. So, I mean, the question of the community, they just want to make sure that it's something that you know. I'm going to say the word expected of you. I'm just going to elaborate on this question. It will be expected of all councillors to be able to be a part of the community and all the different fundraising events or the different do things. That now. We do that now, even with the snowmobile bus. It's no, no, no. I, I, we have to go outside of, of individual groups. I'm talking of the municipality as a whole. Like if they have a yeah, but I'm talking to you about what volunteer is. No, no, I understand that. Yes. That's yes. not the question. The question yes. is for the community, for the municipality. So Canada Day, Father Day, Mother's Day in here. If they have a New Year's Eve party, Christmas, Pampers. I'm not sure. Being in the community myself, I'm not sure exactly what is going forward, but the question was, will you make yourself available on your off-season for community events? I'm available now. Okay. Yes. Super. All right, last question for you two gentlemen is, do you hire locals to work at your campground? Um, do I hire locals? I have, oh yeah, I'm 
talking the mic like it's on. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. So, of course, with people have to understand the financial dynamics of one's business. Do we have, does my campground have enough money to hire somebody? No. Do we barely afford to pay ourselves? Yes. Pretty simple. If I had a lot of extra money, disposable income, would I love not to rake five acres 20 times a year, myself personally? Absolutely. Do we hire a couple of students? <coughs> we do. We hire, we try and find a couple of students to do odd jobs for the year. But fiscally, to hire full-time, part-time employees, the money's not there. I wish it was. I'd love to go and, and hire kids and say, hey, you know, and we try and work with kids. I, our, our business works with uh, the Redford County District School Board for kids that need credits through COA program where they're not capable of getting it in class. We open up our services so those kids can put some hours in in order to get their diploma from high school. We've done that with three kids right now. And we try and see, we're, we're always planning for the future. So that's my answer on that. No, we don't specifically hire local people. Uh, again, uh, Frank just suggested, we don't have the money to do that. The province does not, as everybody knows, the province does not make it easy for small business to hire people. It is very expensive. Uh, there are many, many regulations that are required. For example, in a campground, we deal with fuel. Well, if we were to hire some local person or anybody, the regulations require us to have eyewash stations. It's, it's things like that, that, that it just never ends for our type of business. We are in a type of business that, that we do many different things. And for us to, to be prepared and have all the regulations and safety equipment for whatever might happen is it, virtually just un, not affordable. As a, sorry, as of other government, uh, like, uh, like agriculture and all that, there's programs out there that uh, hire students and hire people for farming agriculture that they subsidize by paying four dollars of the minimum wage and all that. There's none of those programs available for my current business right now, which is tourism. So, you know, if there were programs to help out, it, you know, the numbers we can look at and try and make it work, but it's very, very difficult, as Chris said, with uh, a lot of government red tape, with a lot of things uh, that keep your hands tied, for sure. Great answers, thank you. All right, last question is for Wayne. Your question is, what changes would you like to see in our new council to improve how it functions? That's a good question. I would like to see what the ways that we can work together and solve a lot of these problems and get away from a lot of our later fees that we've been having trouble away. <coughs> that possibly that money could have been put towards the rail bed for kilometer or so we could, we could use today. That's one of the things I would like to. And this thing of all of a sudden getting people come and knock on your door and asking them why are we building. I'm not even in council. I got a call a couple of days ago about building a park in, up in the Park Creek Road. We don't know anything about it. I've been trying for four years to get a ditch in my place fixed up so I can keep the grass cut. I can't get any help from, from the community. Talk. I tried with Mayor Gibson when he was in. I tried with every counselor. You can't get anything done there. So hopefully if I get in, I'm going to try and see if we can solve these problems by working together. That's perfect. Thank you. All right. I want to thank you all again for being on the hot seat. Could I ask you can ask one question and then we're going to end the night and we're going to open the bar and then you can speak to the counselors individually. Good evening. I'm Dave Belvoudro from Mackey. First of all, thanks to all you for taking the effort and putting your name forward. Uh, 
a couple of things. It really comes down to one question, which I'll ask everybody to answer in the proverbial 50 words or less. We've heard uh, about programs for kids. In our community, 250, I think we have less than 20 kids. We have many, 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 many gray hairs, people. Retirees, we're providing programs for them through grants. That's good. I appreciate the effort of the staff who obtained these grants, but we know the new government is going to cut that down. So my question is, in order to try and bring the middle-aged people into our community, what do you see as potential business or improvement plans or any enticement plans that will get people to move here who are in the late 20s, 30s, 40s, rather than people who come here because it's a beautiful place to live, they have no cash because they moved from Toronto and they bought a place in the river. So in, let's make it 45 words or less, what would you do to entice the middle-aged folks to come and live here? Thanks, David. In my opinion, there's one thing that we need here is much better high-speed internet. If we want economic development, if we want young people to move here, if we want all of those things to develop the middle part of our, our community, that's what we need. Because we are not going to get the development that we may want or need without it. And to me that, and we've heard it, Mayor Reed at County Council, um, the Eastern Ontario Rural Network is working very hard uh, now on mobile broadband, and that's how we're hoping, or, or the county is hoping, to make changes uh, in, that, in that vein. But there's many other communities that are saying, ex municipalities in Renfrew County saying exactly the same thing. Um, one meeting I was at, they were talking about uh, it's, it's much easier for the young people who are in those situations that you're talking about to move on the Quebec side because they have the high-speed internet, they have the cheaper properties, they have lower taxes, and that's where they're going. So to me, that's one of the number one things that we have to do if we want to really be in the 21st century. Just to add, David. Good question. Unfortunately, amenities won't bring everybody. We need jobs. I moved here, like I said, 2003, 2004, axe long haul truck driver. My option was if I wanted to continue to work and live in Mackie, was to go to the bush. Okay. We need to entice some sort of industry to come to our area, which is going to be hard to do without the things that we need to provide to them, or manufacturing come to Deep River so that there is an outlet for our residents to get to, other than working at the plant, where does, where does everybody work? Mm -hmm. You know, and we need, not only us, I mean, Deep River, Chalk River, we all need something to change the values of our lives <coughs> in our community to bring people here. I'd love to see the 30-something, 40-something year olds buying property and building new homes and making our community greater than it is right now. But we have a great community, but we have to work on that. We have to entice it. EORN is working very hard on internet. Yeah, is that going to solve all the problems? Probably not, but we need to make an economic decision or not a decision, because we don't make the decision, of trying to get somebody to come here and open a business, whether it's a little business, a big business. I mean, Raj is a good example. He's got a great store, no doubt. It's the only store in town, right? So unless we have, I guess it's like the old movie with the ball field, build it, they will come. And we got to have something like that, otherwise, we're just going to continue on and on and on. Thank you. Well, I've been thinking about your question, and as Debbie said, the internet. It's a lot of young people who have their own businesses can do their work from home if mm -hmm. they have 
the technology behind them. So if they want this type of living where in, on the Ottawa, or they would come to this area if the internet was there, and they can most a lot of the young professionals are doing their home their work from home now anyway. So that would increase hopefully them coming here to enjoy everything all together and raising their young families hopefully. So if we don't have the the continuous the, the programs for the children and these young families come, they would like to probably have programming for their children too. So it's the lifestyle we offer. The internet, yes, try and entice business, but realistically we're so far between any big centers, what are we really going to attract? We're going to attract maybe young families in Deep River, but what what they're here for is the lifestyle, the outdoor lifestyle, the programs, we offer some amazing programs, I mean, child, like playgrounds for your children free in the summer. Where can you go? Not Deep River, but <coughs> So that's what's going to attract people. What do we have to offer? How many free workshops did we do this summer? Oh, it's amazing. Really? Like, I want to retire so I can do some. But uh, in the meantime, that's what we need to keep on promoting ourselves. And we get people from Deep River looking at it going, wow, like, I want to live there. It's a beautiful place, and they've got a lot of things going on that a lot of bigger municipalities do not have. <laughs> um, Did you? So I was given uh, or was told a, a really good statement from somebody that started a new business when they came here. Council asked them, what can we do to help you succeed? Imagine that thought. Council asked the new business, what can we do help you succeed. That's exactly the type of language for business retention, new business, acquiring uh, different mining uh, resources and stuff like that. Hopefully something will go with the mine and visit there. That would be a heck of a huge growth for our area if that ever kicks forward. Um, but it, it, it's business retention because a lot of the businesses around here, a lot of the people that have bought properties stayed at those businesses. So the biggest development of property and new home growth in the area is from people staying at the local businesses around here. So that's important to keep in mind. I know council years ago had an economic development officer and then that was cut out either by funding or like that but we can look at something like that again to try and have you know we all have good ideas but we're not experts in everything and sometimes you got to say you know what let's talk to somebody that has the knowledge and has the expertise and experience to come up with some solutions <laughs> because it does cost money every time we try to try something maybe it's worth investing in somebody who knows the answer and then we can try and implement that. And of course, red tape. Red tape is always everywhere in any government agency or whatever. So limiting red tape and just, you know, it's a very difficult subject. Good question, David. Um, and uh, hopefully that'll come, those manufacturing jobs. They're around the area, but if they ever take off, it's gonna be great. But it's trying to, uh, let's try to re retain business and, and make sure that if there's new business, to support that for sure. I thought, um, I thought one of the issues with uh, new businesses in the area is that we didn't actually have any land available for new businesses to set up on other than we're all classified as residential, but um, if you had 10 acres that was owned by the municipality, that acreage could be maybe sold to a company that could bring a business in. But, we don't have that option as was always my understanding here. So I actually, if you I talk to Jim, the last couple of weeks, economic development has been something that I've been just kind of 
wrap it, trying to get my brain around like what could you bring in here and it always comes back to a tourism issue like what Brent and Chris <coughs> the, the Dowser family has going here so what other tourism um, type of thing could come in here you almost need some kind of a like Weber burgers going down highway 11 yeah. like it draws so many thousands of people there every year just to buy a burger like is there is there something like that that could be developed in in this area but our high speed is an issue and land is an issue unless the government wants to sell us some crown land maybe at a nice low price that we could maybe do something with but I just think it's something that over the the next few years you just have to keep going back and revisiting and seeing what there is that you could maybe what ideas you can come up with but I think council can uh, uh, zone a piece of property to whatever they want if there's any free property to zone, that's right. yeah, yeah, that's right. that thought that was that was the issue. There wasn't that's right. much. Maybe the we old salt have shed. To draw. We have the uh, missing link snowmobile trails. We have uh, potentially the rail bed. That's all good for business, and it will get people here. Uh, the visit free point, the close to whatever that's going, will bring people and probably young people who will be looking to reside in the area, but I think the, the rail bed has great potential. I don't want to keep harping on it, but I think it's just uh, what we've been looking for. I think we have to start by electing a, a council that is well respected and is certainly willing to support any new business. With change comes opportunity. I go back to, you folks have skills and knowledge with forward thinking, whether it by, be by committee or just neighbors discussing, whatever. We can think of new tourism business. You know, again, we go back to the Algonquin Trail. That will open up opportunities, whether it be right off the top of my head. Once this Algonquin Trail is open, it is supposed to connect to the Canada Trail, which goes right across to the west coast. So, first thing that comes to my mind, people are going to be going on ATVs. Well, ATVs, they can't carry much. And they probably don't want to go there and then come back. So here's a quick business. Have a truck, pick up their trailer, and drive it to wherever they're going. So they can go one way, load it back in the trailer, drive their truck as well, and there's a business. It may take a little while for it to get going, like every business does, but it is an opportunity. Change brings all types of opportunities. We just have to have forward thinking <coughs> to uh, discuss them. All right, so if there's any other candidates that haven't spoke on this issue, if you'd like to, we'll give you one more minute. All right, Wayne? It's my turn. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I've talked to a few other families that have bought the property here in back. And I think what we have to do is we have to make them feel comfortable. One of the guys come to me, he said he'd come, he come up, spends $100 every time he comes to a ball game, and he was basically kicked out of here because he came in and bought a beer and brought his own pizza. So we've got to stop this kind of shit. That's what's going on here. All right, anything make else? Make them feel comfortable. I think they'll love it. Here. I agree. Anybody that has, hasn't spoken on this issue? I think the high-speed internet would be a big draw. We've been working towards that. We've been trying to find solutions. Uh, just today it was announced the farmers are looking for $150 million a year to, so they can get high-speed internet just so they can pay their bills on time without being charged interest. Same thing here, hard to get people if your internet connection is not good or whatever. But the social programs, we have to be strong with the social programs for children because if there's nothing here for the kids, Parents are going to leave, and they're not going to bring their kids here because they want to be in town. I grew up here. I knew what it was like to want to be in town. But there wasn't a whole lot going on. 
and we have to make stuff go on so that we have this. And I hear it every day when I'm in the garage. I hear kids play. Not every day. I don't want to. But quite often, kids over here playing at the playgrounds, playing in the ball field. It's great. I haven't seen it here in a long time, and I hope it continues. And the senior programs as well. As far as drawing middle people, well, we try. Diversity. When I first started coming up here before we lived here, there was broom ball. There was a winter carnival. Mm -hmm. There was yeah. a lot of things happening that aren't happening. Higher population. Yeah. We had more population, but we're slowly, nice again. slowly coming back to it. Yeah. All right, folks, we're going to call it a night. Thank you again for all your input, your answers, your questions. And let's give our panel here a great